Hi everyone. I'm Shruti Rajagopalan, the host of the Ideas of India podcast and I'm delighted that podcast merch is now available. We have a tote bag and a mug available for purchase for listeners, a friend or a family member. To buy some merch and support the Ideas of India podcast, visit www.mercatusmerch.com and use the promo code INDIA at checkout for 10% off your purchase. That's www.mercatusmerch.com and use the promo code INDIA to save some money at checkout. Welcome to Ideas of India, where we examine the academic ideas that can propel India forward. My name is Shruti Rajagopalan and I'm a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. And this is the 2022 job market series where I speak with young scholars entering the academic job market about their latest research. I spoke with Mahima Vashisht, a PhD candidate in economics at the University of California Irvine, about her job market paper titled Local Media Reports About Sexual Crimes and Judicial Outcomes in India. We talked about sexual harassment and gender equality, the effect of media coverage on sexual harassment cases and their judicial outcome, whether the gender of local politicians affects case outcomes and much more. For a full transcript of this conversation, including helpful links of all the references mentioned, click the link in the show notes or visit discoursemagazine.com. Hi Mahima, thank you so much for being here. This is such a pleasure. Thanks Shruti. I'm really delighted to discuss my work with you today. Thanks for having me. I'm delighted to read it. So, you know, I want to first get into your paper which is dealing with sexual harassment in the Indian milieu especially when it comes to judicial enforcement. You look at the availability of media reports or the incidence of media reports in a particular jurisdiction and its impact on the judges making the decision for sexual harassment cases. And what you find is that an increase in media reports before the judges make a decision increases the probability of conviction in those cases. And you're looking at a period a year before the actual decision is made so it's it's a fairly long period of time in a sense this kind of media availability which is changing the decision making pattern and the increase is quite substantial it's about 1.36 percentage points that you find which seems like a small amount but it's actually quite large given that only about 12% of the cases you know that's the conviction rate so this is actually a sizable impact so to speak but simultaneously you also find that outside of sexual harassment cases it doesn't have much salience and What is a good way to think about why there is this increase in convictions like what is the underlying mechanism that is linking the availability or the increase in media stories to judicial outcomes Right right so thanks for summarizing my paper so well before i get into the mechanisms let me just start by situating the paper as a general interest one by saying that no discussion about gender equality is complete without addressing that women feel unsafe to date so you know if we talk to our female friends we realize the ways in which that affects our social and economic life we are constantly talking about making safe choices you know whether it is deciding which restaurant to go to with friends and how we get there to the jobs that we are aiming for so sexual harassment is really pervasive across the globe and there are massive costs to pay for that not only in terms of the loss in productive labor but importantly enough in terms of the bare minimum quality of life that we are giving to women and we are constantly made aware of these costs by our society with the victim shaming and the blaming that comes with reporting of these cases and i feel that's one of the very big reasons why these crimes go unreported most of the times specific to india women have strong legal protection by law but there's no denying that the enforcement system is completely broken and that's a big reason to worry because the role of state is paramount here and that's not just in terms of the punishment that's meted out to the perpetrators so there's research that finds that the number of cases that are filed for rape and sexual harassment that's been increasing in the country but a depressingly large fraction of them do not even reach the trial stage and those of us who have braved the system and dealt with the legal process in one way or another we know exactly how the experience can get so harrowing and in fact for the cases that do reach the trial stage they remain pending in the courts for the longest time and they are disposed of at snail speed and the conviction rates are really low so one important point here is that the evidence that substantiates these cases is often so grey 
that the nature of crime resolution heavily relies on you know what he said and what she said in the court and it's really the individual perceptions of all the agents who are involved in the system that matters a lot and that goes from how lawyers are pushing for the case for their clients to how the judges are perceiving the idea of justice in a particular time period for these cases so before i get into discussing the mechanisms in greater depth let me just give a little bit of context to how media reporting can really be important here so the global me too movement has really taken the world by storm and not only has it created a space for victims to speak up about their experiences but importantly enough it has significantly altered our idea of tolerating such crimes in the society and again specific to india the media outrage post the gruesome nirbhaya gang rape case is often seen analogous to the me too movement of the west and data stands testament to that our media has increased coverage of stories about sexual crimes more than ever before and the government of india has brought in some key changes to the indian penal code under the criminal amendment law in 2013 and there's some brilliant research by abhilasha sahai who finds that the reporting has gone up in places where coverage of gang rape case was higher and when women felt more related to the victim based on the social economic status so essentially in this context my paper is an attempt to understand how the legal system works and if it responds to extra legal factors like media coverage about sexual crimes and i'm studying this in the aftermath of the nirbhaya case in india there are two broad channels that have been identified in the literature as to why media reports could lead to changes in judicial outcomes and the first one of them is that the judges could respond to electoral incentives and the public can really hold these judges accountable but that's something that is not likely to be the case in this context since the judges are appointed through a very very rigorous process it's not like we're electing the judges as seems to be the case in the us context and the second channel here is that the media report could alter the perceptions of the agents that are involved now there are three layers to this channel the first being that the reporting behavior could change it's possible that the media reports encourage more victims to file cases that could either alter the number of cases that are being filed or it could change the case composition and by that i mean that we may start seeing cases that are likely to see a conviction get to the court more often the second channel out here and the second agent of decision making here could be the police now if the perceptions of the police is changing in response to the media reports it's possible that the investigation report that they are filing makes for a very strong case in favor of the victim and that is what's driving the conviction result and the third channel here would be the judges the perceptions of the judges now why it would be ideal to actually measure the perceptions of these judges and see the margins they lie on when they are dealing with such cases i do not have a direct measure for that i don't exploit for a direct measure for that in the paper whereas i rely on the time that's taken for case redressal or the time that it takes to get to a final outcome in the case as a measure for the perception of the judges you talk about the media reporting and the increase in media reporting a year before the decision as almost random or as good as random right and so that is the way that you're trying to identify the availability of that information and its impact on judges and therefore on conviction rates right could there be other mechanisms underlying mechanisms that lead to both the increase in media coverage and also the increase in conviction rates irrespective of the channel through the judges right and is it possible that media will tend to report more on cases where there is more information and since you don't look at hard crimes like rape and gang rape and you're looking at sexual harassment only where we don't have forensic evidence where we don't have much of a paper trail and so on right it's very much a he said she said story the cases where there is more information and better information are more likely to lead to a conviction but those are also the same cases that are more likely to be talked about in the media right and more likely to be better investigated by the police so all the three layers that you're talking about the mechanism is not through the media but it's actually endogenous to the quality of the case itself which is these are cases where there's just a clearer picture so there can be more information at all levels 
So why is that not the story that is going on? That's a great way to put it. So it's definitely possible that the media is reporting for more cases that have more evidence. So in order to understand that a little better, I do dig into the media reports a little bit. So I do conduct a qualitative analysis on these media reports. I select 50 random media reports from my sample and I do an in-depth analysis of what's exactly the content of these media reports. And I find that 63% of them are actually factual. They are just reporting the incident the way it stands. And most of them are about sexual assaults. They're not about harassment. They're about actual rape cases that are reported in the police. So those media reports are just about what happened. They're just factually stating what the incident looked like, that it has been filed in the police. The people surrounding, like people in the neighborhood or the parents are really angry that this happened. And that's really about it. It's not saying anything more about the evidence or anything else. It's really talking about the cases that reach the police. So it's after they have been filed in the police station is when the media report is actually talking about them. And a minority of them, about 18% of them are political statements. Those go either way. Some political statements that are condemning the level of sexual crimes in the society and some of them which are really heavily blaming the victims and calling out women for being responsible for the crime being inflicted upon them. And it's really a very, very small majority of them that talk about the case outcome in itself. And that predominantly happens after the case has been solved. So yes, it is true that the media reports are about the cases that have already been filed. You know, in some sense, it's less about the soft discussion that's happening around sexual harassment. But that's exactly what makes it interesting that it's only when these big cases or these strong cases are reaching the police or they are making big headlines. That's when people start caring about them so much. And when the magnitude of these reports are going up, that's when we start seeing impacts on the perceptions or impacts on the case outcomes. Another way to think about it is in the earlier part of the discussion, you were talking about how the process is punishment for women, right? Like, I mean, first there is the sexual harassment or assault, and then there is the judicial harassment and the investigative harassment, right? And also it goes on for years, so you're basically reliving that moment for a really long time. Now, my question is, is the increased conviction rate endogenous to the nature of the complainant, right? Or the victim? That is, only the people who have the grit to see this through and who have the stomach to discuss this for years on end are the ones who are going to be talking to the media and are also going to be the ones who are pushing for this with the police and the judiciary, right? So is this story one that is endogenous to the victim more than a judge perception story? So in your qualitative analysis, do you see the media talking more to the victim's and naming the victims and so on, because that's also not allowed by law, but you know, they do do that anyway. Do you see a lot of that going on in the media reporting, which would make me think this is endogenous to the victim? Yeah, so that's a great point. I do not find that the media is talking about the story from the victim's perspective at all. It does seem to be a lot more about just stating the facts and the case. In my analysis, I found just one report maybe where the victim themselves were talking about the crime that happened. But most of them are still about other cases. They are just like reporting other cases as this time. They are not talking to the victims. No, but I mean, where are they getting the facts if they're not talking to the victims? They must be getting the facts somewhere, right? So it's the victims or the victims' families. What I mean is someone is giving them that information. Sure. And it seems like the victims have the most interest in this case to provide information to the media, right? And the same people who are likely to be able to provide that information are also likely to be able to withstand this judicial scrutiny that all these women are put through anyway. Right, right, right. So to that, I would say that the fact that I'm looking at the cases that have already begun trial, these seem to be like a final outcome in themselves, right? It's not like all the cases are reported. A depressing majority of them are not reported to begin with. Then after they are reported, 
most of them don't even reach the trial stage so we are indeed looking at a really really minority of those cases where the victims have the grit or they have the confidence to take this case forward and they're very strong in taking this case forward so we are dealing with those minority of the cases to begin with and i don't think there would be any variation across space and time especially in the small window that i'm looking at i'm only looking at the cases that are filed between 2014 and 18 so in that small window it may be unlikely that there's a lot of variation in these cases that are reaching the court the fact that they've already begun trial and we are seeing that there is an impact on the outcome on these margins is rather interesting but to go back to your paper you talk about how this has no impact on rape convictions right and the way the indian penal and evidence system is designed the requirement in cases of rape the punishment is higher and there is also a much higher level of evidence which is hard evidence right physical evidence so this is you know whether a medical kit was performed and other kinds of physical evidence in case of sexual assault which is not always the case with just sexual harassment cases right so that's an important distinction why do you think you don't find that difference when it comes to cases that require more hard evidence you know it would lend credence to the theory of you know when it's a he said she said more information forthcoming from the victims is likely to get reported in the media and therefore also the judges versus hard cases that require physical evidence you know in which case there's no impact Yeah so that's a uh, really an interesting thing that i find and i feel like that's happening because again like you said that the punishment for the rape cases is much higher as compared to those in sexual harassment the sexual harassment cases that we're talking about are of a nature that they are very very grave so we're talking about these new type of sexual harassment so again in the time period that we're talking about we are talking about these new type of sexual harassment that are now considered as criminal offense like voyeurism or stalking the fact that these rape cases come with such hard forensic evidence and there is a much higher punishment for these crimes there might be lower discretion that the judges might have in these cases whereas in sexual harassment the fact that the evidence is so grey it relies a lot on the statement of the victims and the way the story is getting built in the court the judges might still have a lot more discretion there in terms of their own perceptions on how they think the crime is situated in that time period that is under consideration so you know i find this interesting because i think this leads more credence to the greater information availability story once again right that we were talking about at the beginning because it seems like cases that rely more on you know murky information where it's not clear exactly what happened versus cases where it's clearer because there is other kinds of supporting evidence right so now this leads me to think that again those cases where there's greater evidence are more likely to be reported in the media and therefore also more likely to be better represented in court and that's what's leading to the conviction as opposed to some fundamental change in perception because if it were a change in perception then the judges who are now you know just constantly seeing this media reporting increased media reporting on crimes against women should be more sensitized to the fact that hard evidence is harder to find right and so the convictions in rape cases should also go up if it's a story of judicial perception i think that's an interesting way to put this but i would also mention here that i do find that the time that's taken in redressing these cases or in giving the final verdict significantly goes up right so had it been the case that it's only the cases that have stronger evidence those are the ones that are reaching the court and those are the ones that are being reported in the media to be driving the conviction result i would have found that the media reporting before the case filing is what would be driving this outcome right whereas i don't find any impact of media report before filing so in some sense i do look at the media reporting before the cases are filed on the number of cases that are getting filed and i don't find any impact it's not like more sexual harassment or more rape cases are getting filed in response to these media reports so the reporting behavior is not changing there secondly it's still possible that the number of cases were not changing but the composition of the cases were getting changed however again had it been that the case in itself was coming with hard evidence if that is what was likely to drive the conviction result 
it would have been the media reporting before the case filing to matter whereas again it does not matter it's really the media reporting during the cases in trial is what's driving my outcome result here so it's not bulletproof this method of ruling out the reporting behavior change but i can still comfortably say that it's not something that's being driven by the case quality or the case characteristics so you know now coming to the broader question when you're talking about it takes longer to resolve these cases is that true just a sexual harassment cases where it leads to a conviction or is it just all cases that are taking longer because judicial pendency is also a major problem yes. when it comes to you know enforcement of crimes against women yes certainly certainly so what i really find there is that an increase in media reporting is leading to an increase in the time that's taken to reach a final decision for sexual harassment cases i also see an increase for rape cases although that's not significant but interestingly i'm finding that increase to translate into the more time that's taken to resolve non violent property crimes so these are the crimes that should not get affected by media reporting about sexual crimes right and as a placebo check i do find that when media reports about sexual assaults are increasing they do not seem to matter at all for the conviction in non violent property crimes whereas i see a corresponding increase in the time that's taken in getting at a final decision for these non violent property crimes these are the cases that are being dealt by the same judges who are dealing with the sexual harassment cases So in some sense and the magnitude of that increase in time is exactly similar to the increase that we find in sexual harassment cases so in some sense we can argue that there is a likely substitution that's happening in a situation where the system is so strained and we are struggling with judicial capacity already there are likely to be implications for court efficiencies here so yes i mean this is suggestive of the fact that the judges are more likely to spend time scrutinizing these cases that's true for the cases that are reaching conviction that's true for the cases that are not getting convicted in sexual harassment but that also has externalities on the other cases that are being discussed in the court yeah i think it may also have to do with the fact that a lot of the newer crimes that have been introduced on the books like sexual harassment is a classic example right like i mean some of these crimes were on the books but they were never really you know reported filed never made it to court kind of cases and same for the you know non violent property crimes and so on there's a lot of new stuff on the books and maybe this is also reflecting the fact that the judges are also learning how to navigate these cases in this new environment because this is something new for the indian judicial system as a whole right and that really makes the whole idea about the perceptions and what the local sentiment looks like really a lot more important right because it's new for everybody and you're moving with the times in some sense i see where you're going with this more generally i feel like this has bigger implications right because a very large part of the cost to the perpetrators of sexual harassment and you know sexual crimes against women more generally it's the probability of conviction you know the expected value of that right the expected cost is the probability of conviction times the punishment right and we know that punishment is very high in india but the conviction rates are woefully low in fact the reporting rates are woefully low so even with convictions we're talking about a tiny fraction of cases which actually make it to the courts you found a 1.36 percentage point increase which is non trivial given that the conviction rate is only 12% but how much of a dent will something like this make in the larger picture of reducing sexual harassment because now these cases are actually going to court they're getting resolved and the conviction rates are higher what is your hunch because i know this is difficult to measure absolutely and that's a great point and i believe harder to answer with my paper but my hunch is that and this is something i plan on looking into for my future work that when more of these cases are getting convicted when women start feeling that the system is on their side and they are ready to punish the perpetrators there may be an increase in reporting a and the fact that it's becoming increasingly costly to perpetrate these crimes might even reduce this behavior in future it's just that the perpetrators are always out on the road right they are always free to roam around on the roads and as victims women feel like the system is always against them and it's not on their side so that really perpetuates the whole cycle of sexual crimes in the society 
I mean, even though yours is not a depressing result, in the overall picture, this is still a very depressing story. I agree. I agree. Yeah. You know, to switch gears, because you've written lots of interesting papers and I want to, you know, talk about some of your other work. You're also looking at gender and politics. You know, this paper that we just talked about is more about like gender and judiciary in one sense. And you're looking at how male versus female politicians make decisions, right? And the standard narrative in India is that political decision making by politicians is gendered, right? In the sense that there are different kinds of issues that women care about versus what men care about. And when women come to power and they are the representatives, they are more likely to fix those issues, right? We have pretty robust evidence at the panchayati level. And we know that, you know, representation at the parliamentary level for women is very, very low. It's mandated at the panchayati level through reservation. So it's much higher there. You're actually looking at the intermediate level, which is at the state government level, which is MLAs. And what you find is actually there isn't much of a difference between male versus female MLAs when it comes to traditionally gendered issues like education, right? And so even though women actually talk more about education, right, in the run up to the elections or while they are MLAs, it doesn't actually change the number of schools, the amount of investment in education or anything like that. Why is this the case? Like, what do you think is going on? Is the story one of, you know, sort of like what Bhumi Prohit finds, which is, you know, the, the women lack the networks and the political and social capital and therefore the agency to work across different channels? Is it a question of party support? Is it a question of there are other gendered issues, you know, like water and women's safety, which are trumping education, which is still more a universal issue than a gendered issue. So what is the story? Why do we not see women when they come to power actually take more action, even though they talk more about it? Absolutely. So that's exactly what got me interested in this paper. And thanks for mentioning Bhumi's work, because I essentially hinge on her, the channel that she suggests. I am looking at elections that happen between 2008 and 2018. And I'm looking at constituency level school building that's happening in the election years. So I'm looking at constituencies where a woman narrowly got elected against a man. And I'm comparing those constituencies to constituencies where a man narrowly won against a woman. And I find that there's no difference in the growth in school construction in the areas where we are electing female politicians, which we would expect to happen, given that we find anecdotal evidence that women seem to care more about education. Now, there could be several channels at play, as you suggested. Lower political network could be one of them, but I don't find that to be the case. So I look at whether the female politician is an incumbent or not, and I don't find that that seems to matter. Secondly, it could be differences in candidate quality. You could expect that there's evidence that women are less likely to have criminal records against them. And I mean, there's this whole understanding that the criminal politicians might know how to get the work done. But given these differences in criminal backgrounds or in candidate quality, I don't find that that's something that's likely to drive the result. But what I find using, again, descriptive evidence is hinging upon the fact that women could have lower political agency. So I use candidate and constituency level data from two states on the development project expenditure that is conducted under the local area development scheme. So this scheme essentially allows all the MLAs to apply for funding for discretionary projects that could help in local development. So they're free to decide what they want to spend on and they can submit applications for those projects and get them sanctioned. Now, what I find is really interesting there. I find that women on an average get fewer projects sanctioned as compared to the men. And interestingly, for the projects that are sanctioned, I find that women are getting less amount sanctioned for those projects. And that difference is huge. It's about 80,000 US dollars less for women as compared to the men. And, you know, amongst these projects that are sanctioned, it's rather interesting to find that the share of expenditure on education-related activities for both men and women seems to be very similar. So, I mean, we do believe that women care a lot more about education, but we don't see that happening when we are looking at expenditure-related data. But the fact that they're getting such few funds sanctioned and they're getting less money allocated might signal towards the fact that they have lower political agency in getting this done. So overall, you're saying they get less money sanctioned 
and so they have less ability to kind of go into this discretionary expenditure and indulge the areas that they truly care about relative to the men exactly but even with less spending power there isn't that much difference in education because you know both men and women seem to be investing about the same so is there difference in other areas outside of education when it comes to male versus female spending Yes so in this data i find that women do spend a larger share of the money that they get on community building this includes activities like setting up a community hall where people could come together and sit there is more spending on religious activities so spending a temple or let's say a road going to the temple and in agriculture related activities okay so very much areas that affect rural women Exactly. In a sense who are generally not taken care of by the state and state provisioning of goods as much but it is less gendered than one imagines. It's not Absolutely. water, yes. it is not safety, it is not education, it is not you know anganwadis. That's not what the story of what's going on. Yes. And part of the reason that's happening probably is because education is such a state sponsored subject and center does have a role to play but the fact that you are ultimately interacting so much with the male dominant environment in the government that's probably a margin you can't really impact on when we're talking about fiscal capacities. Yes, women end up being great role models when it comes to education and there's research that finds that that's indeed the case but when it comes to actual expenditure level changes the lack of political agency and the fact that it's such a male dominated environment really seems to matter i feel so you know i mean it's going to be bizarre for me to link your two papers but does having female mlas in a particular region or the particular area you know that particular gram panchayat or urban local body becoming reserved for women seat or having a female parliamentarian does any of this affect the district court decisions at all that's interesting that's something i haven't explicitly tested for but i do look at the differences in the conviction probabilities and my case out judicial outcomes by looking at the gender of the judges and i find that female judges are more likely to respond to these media reports it's not significant but the direction of the coefficient is as expected To answer to the political environment I look at the share of criminally accused politicians that are in power in the district so I look at the share of politicians who are accused of major crimes and these include assaults murders crimes against women and I do find that judges are less likely to respond to media reports when there are more criminally accused politicians in power but again it's not significant but it's indicative of the directions we would expect the judicial decision making to function in yeah and you know i think it may not just be the judges right it's the police is basically state level control yes so if you have you know very powerful politicians at the state level who are basically criminals then in those kinds of cases you would expect the police to be less responsive when it comes to investigations and so on versus i was imagining that if there are women and especially women who don't have these kinds of criminal cases against them especially against other women right which for women tends to usually be dowry cases are the number one you know sort of hard crimes on which women are accused against you know by other women but anyway you know when it comes to women it might not be the channel through the judges it might be actually the channel through the police is my imagination right that's absolutely plausible but again i go back to my empirical strategy in terms of the fact that i am looking at these media reports before the judge is making the decisions essentially after the police has already filed their report so the metric that i'm using is in some sense is something that's affecting the judge's decision rather than the police engagement in the court but yes it's something worth investigating in greater detail in going forward and certainly looking at the interactions with the gender breakup in the government yeah no this stuff is fascinating i think it's like a broad research program you know encompassing all levels of government or branches of government and i'm excited to read more of this work absolutely <laughs> You know to move on to a happier note because it's so depressing to discuss sexual harassment and basically the state of the judiciary what have you been up to through this pandemic period 
so i was uh, very lucky to be back home with my family in india i did manage to be with them during the pandemic and i was really binge watching a lot of shows i was baking <laughs> i had a new found love for baking tea cakes and thanks to shows like marvelous mrs mazel and indian matchmaking we were having our own little chai pe charcha at home discussing these <laughs> important gender issues <laughs> so my personal and my professional life was quite muddled out there and i was inflicting <laughs> this upon the rest of my household <laughs> no the marvelous mrs mazel i just actually really loved that show thank you so much for doing this mahima this was such a pleasure thanks shruti i had a lot of fun talking to you Ideas of India is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Help us grow by giving us a rating and leaving a review. Follow us on Twitter at S Rajagopalan and at Ideas of India. Also check out our initiative commemorating 30 years of India's market reforms at the 1991project.com.